Good afternoon. I'm George Blumenthal, Chancellor at UC Santa Cruz, and I want to welcome you to the 2011 Foundation Forum. This is a great event that allows us to have interesting discussions with a list of eminent panelists. I know because one year I actually did it myself as a panelist. <laughs> Tonight is a very special, or this afternoon is a very special program. We have some great guests, some great panelists, including our own David Hausler and Art Levinson, uh, the chairman of the board of Genentech, and also my old friend Mike Bishop, the former chancellor at UC Santa Cruz. Mike is a very interesting guy uh, because uh, uh, he wrote a, a book that I would encourage all of you to read. It's called How to Win a Nobel Prize. <laughs> Mike is also the father of a banana slug. His son graduated from UC Santa Cruz. Now we'll have the formal introductions in just a minute of our panelists, but I want to introduce uh, our host for this evening, uh, Ken Doctor. Ken is the president, actually the new president of the UC Santa Cruz Foundation. He is a noted journalist, a, a noted author, and a noted person being committed to UC Santa Cruz. Formerly, he was the head of the UCSC Alumni Association, and as you might have guessed, he is a graduate of UC Santa Cruz. So without further ado, let's welcome Ken Doctor. Thank you very much, Chancellor. Uh, on behalf of the UC Santa Cruz Foundation, we are very happy to welcome you all to the Foundation Forum. This has become an annual tradition, and in fact, it is the 10th annual Foundation Forum, and I know a number of you have come for a number of years already. We have a great uh, conversation today, and what this is about is a great public conversation place that we have every fall with passionate, creative, and committed people. You'll have uh, a moderator and three guests. Uh, each one of these uh, people is uh, very distinguished in their field. Among the panelists, each one is already legendary in a field that is too, uh, too near and dear to us, I would say, uh, talking about newer approaches in the diagnosis and treatment of cancer. Nobel Laureate Mike Bishop is the Chancellor Emeritus of UCSF and Professor of Department in the Department of microbiology and immunology. Art Levinson is the chairman of the board and former CEO of Genentech. And I have the great honor tonight on behalf of the foundation of presenting to both Mike and Art the foundation medal at our founder celebration dinner. That foundation medal recognizes individuals of exceptional distinction whose work and contributions to society illustrate the ideals and vision of our UC Santa Cruz. Both Mark and, Mark and Mike and Art exemplify this outstanding level of leadership, and we're delighted to have them here today to talk in at length and at dinner. Our third guest and panelist is UCSC's own distinguished professor of biomolecular engineering. These are very compound, uh, very compound academic uh, to terms, David Hausler. Uh, David is the center is, uh, is the uh, is the director of the Center for Biomolecular Biomolecular Science and Engineering, and an investigator for the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. We're also lucky to have a great moderator for our event. Moira Gunn is the host of uh, two programs on National Public Radio, Tech Nation and Biotech Nation. Tech Nation began, I think, uh, almost 20 years ago. I think it's coming up on its uh, 19th or 20th anniversary at this point. It's heard on 200 public radio stations and technation.com. It uh, chronicles the amazing twists and turns of tech, especially in our neighboring Silicon Valley, uh, all the way uh, back into the last century. Moira recently won the National Science Board's 2011 Public Service Award, and she got a free trip to the State Department. I'm not sure if she'll tell you about that today. In her spare time, she is an assistant professor of global information systems and biotechnology uh, at the University of San Francisco. So please join me in welcoming all of these great guests for this year's Foundation Forum.
it's, it's great to see everybody here, and it's really great. I already know we have some Tech Nation and Biotech Nation listeners. Um, Tech Nation, of course, has been our full hour show, and, uh, when te and when biotech, I'm really an engineer. My PhD is in mechanical engineering. Uh, who, who needed biotech? What was that all about? So when it, it uh, ran up and grabbed me by the throat, we decided to do Biotech Nation. We put it right at the end of the show, and we've never looked back. That was 2004. It's definitely the most popular part of the show because, hey, who doesn't have DNA? It's very simple. It's very simple. Um, and for those of you who listen to the biotech segment regularly, which you can do separately on the Internet, um, the world we know is changing. Welcome to Biotech Nation. Now, today it is really my pleasure to introduce to you some of the, uh, all of the panelists today, because they play such a role uh, both in its past, its current uh, uh, embodiment, and its future. And it's a very exciting time for us. First of all, we have Mike uh, Bishop, the Chancellor Emeritus of the University of California, San Francisco, and a university professor in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology. In 1989, rather, Mike Bishop was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine with Harold Varmus for the discovery that growth regulating genes in normal cells can malfunction and initiate the abnormal growth processes of cancer. Under his chancellorship at UCSF, it has become a premier institution with leading professional schools of dentistry, medicine, nursing, and pharmacy a top-ranked biomedical research graduate division, and two of the nation's leading hospitals. This includes its innovative Mission Bay campus with state-of-the-art biomedical research facilities. He continues to teach medical students and supervises a research team at UCSF studying the molecular pathogenesis of cancer. And as a Nobel Prize winner, he has his own parking place, which should <laughs> So if you weren't motivated before, let's give a big round of applause. Just get on that Nobel train now, because there are many rewards, many rewards. Next we have Art Levinson. He is the chairman of the board and former CEO of Genentech. Coincidentally, as a postdoc, Art worked in the lab of Mike Bishop and Har Harold Varmus at UCSF. In 1980, he joined Genentech, where he began as a researcher and ultimately became the CEO in 1995. Genentech is considered the founder of the biotech industry. It works on, it uses uh, human genetic information to discover and manufacture medicines to treat patients with serious or life-threatening medical conditions. Oncology remains the major focus of Genentech's research. Art Levinson. It's also my great pleasure to introduce UCSC's Distinguished Professor of Biomolecular Engineering, David Hausler. David is the director of the Center for Biomolecular Science and Engineering and an investigator for the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Tomorrow, he flies to Oxford to receive the Weldon Prize in Genetics. Thank you. Now, I understand you should have cards available to you. If you don't, you will see people walking the aisles. And what we'll do is, as we're going forward, if you would fill out questions on cards um, at about, uh, oh, a quarter to four, something like that, or a little later, I'm going to get a selection of them and then put them together and, and ask questions uh, directly from the audience. In the meantime, we'll have a conversation ourselves. But starting, each of our panelists will make a presentation. So let's start, let's ask uh, Mike Bishop to start. Great. Thank you, Mara. About that parking space. <laughs> I chose it in 1989, way in the back of our facility, very close to my lab. When I became chancellor, it was assumed I would want to move to the front of the facility close to my office. I kept the one in the back. I never had to cross a picket line. I, ne I never had to confront an animal rights demonstrator. And I was equidistant to my two offices. All right, we're going to talk with you about cancer. Uh, this is certainly one of the most fearsome adversaries of humankind. One person in three in this room will develop the disease. One in four will die of it. 
And when I began my research career in 1968, we knew nothing about the genesis of cancer. We knew only of a few causes, and we had not a clue about why cells would suddenly run rampant and create a cancer. Over the last 30 decades, science has produced a fundamental understanding of what's wrong in cancer cells, and that understanding is now informing the development of therapeutics, uh, the analysis or the examination of cause, the development of new prognostics and diagnostics and detection devices. It has revolutionized our approach to cancer, and that's what we're going to talk to you about. And <clears throat> I'm going to start the story uh, in 1970, when for the first time, a gene was shown to be able to cause cancer. In all, uh, in, uh, in all, of all places, uh, this gene was found in a chicken virus, a virus that causes sarcomas, tumors of tissues like muscle, in chickens, and was discovered by Peyton Rouse in 1909. So it's called Rouse sarcoma virus. Now, the, the, vir the, the gene is called SARC because it causes cancer. And we soon learned that there are only four genes in this virus. Uh, it's a very simple creature. Three of those genes, as shown in this picture, are devoted to replicating the virus. So they're essential to the virus. The SARC gene causes cancer. But we know from a variety of experiments that it is not essential to the virus. You can take it away from the virus, and the virus replicates just fine. Harold Varmus and I had just begun to work together uh, in 1970 when we looked at this uh, peculiar uh, fact uh, and wondered what it might mean. Uh, why would a virus have a gene that served it no purpose? That doesn't make any sense from the vantage point of evolution, of natural selection. And it's, it, on a hunch, we decided that perhaps the virus had acquired this gene from a normal cell in which it replicates. And after three or four years of arduous experimentation uh, with our young colleagues doing most of the work, that turned out to be the case. There is a cellular SARC in every one of uh, your cells and in the cells of every multicellular organism. It has a normal function in your body. It is vital. When it was transplanted into that virus by an accident of nature, it suffered damage, which we call a mutation. And that damage converted it to a cancer gene. It was not long before this was shown to be happening over and over again with a variety of normal cells. This kind of virus had a propensity for picking up normal cellular genes and some of these genes, if damaged or mutated, uh, became cancer genes. This led to a, a general scheme. We call the cellular genes proto-oncogenes. The word oncogene means tumor gene. We had a viral oncogene in SARC and then suddenly dozens more, all of them acquired from cells, all of them pirating cellular genes that in the process become mutated or otherwise uh, perverted and become viral oncogenes. The obvious next conclusion was perhaps you don't need a virus in the picture. Perhaps all cancers arise in this way. At, but by contrast to the virus, the mutation is introduced by an external factor, like the ultraviolet light and sun that causes skin cancer, like the chemicals in cigarette smoke that causes lung cancer. That is now a fundamental tenet. We know it is correct. And we believe that all cancer arises from the malfunction of genes, although there are many causes of cancer, and unfortunately we don't know uh, many of those causes. They all seem to damage genes or otherwise disturb their function, and that is what gives rise to the malignant state of cells, of cancer cells. There are two kinds of genetic malfunction in cancer cells. One we can equate to a jammed accelerator. These are things that drive the cells to do what they have to do, but can be controlled, just as we control an accelerator. The malfunction is that the accelerator has become jammed by a mutation or some other change in the cell. The other sort of gene is a break. And in a cancer cell, the break is defective. So we call the jammed accelerators 
oncogenes derived from proto-oncogenes, and we call the defective breaks tumor suppressor genes, and you will find those terms in the New York Times, so I'm not embarrassed to present them to you. Okay, so that's, that's it. That's exactly how cancer arises. All causes funnel into this genetic keyboard and cause its disharmony. So what do we need to exploit this knowledge? Well, we need a complete inventory. We need to know every gene that's capable of doing this and everyone that's malfunctioning in every type of human cancer, in every individual's cancer. Uh, and we're going to get this information primarily by decoding all of the genes in cancers. And that's something you will hear about from David Hausler. Uh, this is a huge enterprise, well underway. Uh, it is already informing our uh, uh, develop, uh, de the way we manage cancer, and it is going to eventually revolutionize it. To dramatize this point, here's a list of the different aspects of cancer that genome information is having an impact on. I'm not going to go into the details. I show you the list just so you have a feeling for how long it is and how it covers everything from the identification of cause to personalization of therapy to the improvement of clinical trials. It's every conceivable aspect of cancer is going to have, uh, is, is going to benefit from, from the the genomic approaches that you'll be hearing about. But the one we're going to focus on today is therapeutics. Uh, and this story begins at the turn of the 20th century with a young biomedical scientist named Paul Ehrlich. Uh, Ehrlich had already developed an antitoxin for diphtheria for which he eventually received the Nobel Prize. But after that, he became interested in staining human tissues with organic dyes, which he got from the Farber Corporation. And he discovered that there were some dyes that stained uh, germs, bacteria in human tissue without staining the tissue cells. And this gave him a vision of what he called magic bullets. He coined the term. Chemicals that might attack an infectious agent while sparing the normal cells of the organism. He proceeded to do the first drug screen and eventually found such a, a magic bullet for syphilis, which made him world famous. But his ultimate objective was cancer. And between 1904 and 1909, he put hundreds of chemicals onto cancer cells in test tubes and never found a magic bullet. He died in 1915, deeply disillusioned, telling his wife in his deathbed that he had wasted his life. Now we're in a position to create magic bullets, to, to fulfill Paul Ehrlich's vision. Because cancer genes create therapeutic targets that are not found in normal cells. And we can attack these cells preferentially in principle and now in practice. That is to say we can attack the outlaw cell without necessarily harming, harming the innocent bystander. There are three approaches to this dictated by the nature of the malfunction. One, we try to shut down the jammed accelerator. We're good at that. We know how to do that with drugs. It's a growth industry and you'll hear about that. Second, you might hope to restore the defective breaks. We can't do that at the moment, and I don't see any hope of doing it in the near future, although we might be able to revive some of them uh, based on the nature of the damage in them. And third, there's a newly emerging uh, approach that I call attacking from the flank, uh, and I'm not going to go into details on that. The virtue of this is that it is effective. It can be used against both types of malfunction, accelerator and defective breaks. The point is, we are making remarkable progress uh, in this direction. Uh, so the person who's going to tell you about how to inhibit jammed accelerators is my former uh, young colleague, and uh, 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 you've heard about him, Art Levinson. Uh, and there he is on the left with me almost 40 years ago. And if you look carefully at that Petri dish, there's absolutely nothing on it. <laughs> so in the wake of um, the aftermath of this uh, magnificent and monumental discovery by Mike and Harold that in the genome of all of us lied the seeds of uh, you know, potential destruction as it relates to cancer, Let's, I wanted to just step back and ask, well, how have we done? Uh, I, I think the, 
simple verdict is we've done pretty well, but there's a lot more to do. But certainly, Mark, uh, Mike's work uh, opened the, um, the pathway to intervene in an intelligent fashion in terms of cancer therapeutics. So let's uh, judge this by a couple of different uh, criteria. First of all, uh, this is a, a graph um, produced by the ACS, American Cancer Society. Uh, it's, it's, it's out of date, but that's okay, um, and, because I'm gonna really spend the rest of my remarks talking about pretty much the work after 2000. But what this shows uh, is the cumulative survival uh, of women uh, suffering from breast cancer, and you can see as a function of um, time from the reoccurrence of breast cancer uh, what the survival rates are by five-year periods uh, as a function on the x-axis of, of time. So you can see that we've made some very, very good progress, um, but obviously what we would like to do is, is, is really be up here. And the progress before 1998 or 99 or so basically came about through the uh, identification and application of a very powerful poisons that kill essentially growing cells uh, with a lot of uh, bad side effects. But um, because this of, of, of Mike and Harold's work and, and the genetic revolution and the dissection uh, at the really a molecular level, atomic level, of the structure of genes involved in cancer, we now have, as Mike mentioned, under exposed most of the targets, uh, allowing us to at least see if we can potentially intervene at a very specific level maybe even on a patient-by-patient -patient level uh, to stop the growth of the cancer. And that's where I'm going to uh, take this from now. And I'm going to go through just a few slides quickly. Uh, clearly, the, the, the observation that got all this going was the, the work that led to Mike and Harold's Nobel Prize. Um, I need to credit Mike in an additional way here. Um, you know, as his postdoc, one of many postdocs, um, Mike was always extremely generous at providing his students the, all the research tools that they employed as postdocs in his lab so that they went off in their nascent careers, they would have you know, the ability to at least have the tools to allow them the possibility of being successful. You know, unlike a, a, a lot of people um, who you know, took a different approach and, and, and didn't necessarily make all these reagents available, Mike was just unbelievably great in that regard and, and, and gave us essentially every probe from these viral oncogenes um, to me, to others uh, at, at Genentech, to see whether or not they could be useful at exposing or unraveling these latent genes that are in all of us uh, in, a, in a form that obviously and, and hopefully always never will cause cancer. So one of the first things um, that, 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 that I did when I joined the company, we used one of the probes, the many, one of the many probes that Mike provided, and it was a probe that represented the cancer-causing gene of one of these chicken viruses that caused a type of cancer called erythroleukemia. And we asked whether or not, way back then, uh, there was a human version of that gene. Did that gene basically reside in some earlier or primitive or, or, or native form in human cells? And the answer was, uh, yes, we found it right here. This was a, a, a great technician in the lab. Uh, and and uh, in 1982, uh, these are the, the, the sequence, and you can see his uh, little comment here. This is it, number five, woof, woof. This is his version, <laughs> I guess, of Eureka. Um, but that was that sequence. Um, w w Skipping a lot of other steps, um, some, some wonderful work by Lisa Cousins in, in Axel Ehrlich's lab, they were able to take that, that little piece of that gene and kind of bootstrap their way up and get the entire gene uh, that was expressed. And it turned out, lo and behold, jumping ahead many years, that that very gene was the HER2 gene about which I will now speak a bit. Uh, another important observation that was made in 1987 by Slayman and Ulrich uh, uh, is that women with breast cancer, about a quarter to a third of them, have way too much of the protein that's encoded by that particular gene. And it turns out that that protein exists on the surface of these cancer cells, and if a woman had this high level of this particular protein on the surface of the cell, then her prognosis was a lot worse uh, and more dire than a woman with breast cancer who didn't make too much of this protein. So in, just in, in a nutshell, we decided then to see if we can make an antibody. This is, these are the thing, the molecules that, that, that you make to fight infections, for example. Uh, and could we target that particular protein on the surface of these breast cancer cells? Uh, and if so, might that slow or stop the growth of the cancer? Uh, and 
uh, I'm just going to show you one of many, many clinical slides here. Um, we showed that in women with late stage disease, it increased survival, this, pro this particular antibody, by about 50%. But we were interested also in asking whether or not if applied earlier in the course of a disease, might, the, might that antibody even be more effective um, since you're, you're treating uh, an earlier stage cancer. There's reasons to think why that might be the case, and we, we think it is the case. So what you're looking at here uh, is what's called the treatment in the adjuvant setting. Adjuvant meaning really upon diagnosis, surgery, the earliest presentation of the disease. And you ask whether or not this drug, which is called Herceptin, in addition to chemo, uh, so chemo alone is this blue line, and uh, chemo plus this Herceptin drug, whether or not improves outcomes for women with breast cancer who make too much of this protein. And this is the, the years from the trial um, uh, entry, uh, and the percentage of women who are alive without disease. If you have disease after the surgery and chemo, and, and you fail those approaches, the disease is, 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 uh, is, is a very serious uh, of a very serious consequence. So this is the percentage of people who are alive with no disease. And you can see the addition of Herceptin makes a dramatic difference. And typically the way this curve is now running out since we have this, that if the disease, you can see these curves start to flatten. If by five or six years you're free of disease, you essentially are always going to be free of, uh, of disease. So it does seem like there's a, a dramatic improvement in survival by the administration of this particular uh, antibody that targets in a very specific way uh, the aberrant nature of that protein. And I won't read this, but uh, the, the New England Journal uh, uh, chose to write an editorial on the effectiveness and, and the design of this uh, particular trial and the outcome of this trial. And I, I should also add that because this is a very targeted approach, um, that the, 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 side effects, the side effects associated with this drug are actually, they're not non-existent, but they're really quite mild relative to typical chemotherapy that basically goes after and kills every dividing cell. Now, I'm just going to end with a couple of slides on a second uh, uh, type of cancer, and that's malignant uh, melanoma. There are about 70,000 people in the United States every year diagnosed with, with, with melanoma, and about 60% of patients have a defect, a one nucleotide a defect out of three billion nucleotides in the cell change um, in a, a gene that encodes a protein called BRAF. Doesn't really matter what it does, but it causes this protein to be extremely active in what's called the signal transduction pathway, in the pathway that basically tells a cell to divide. So it's kind of like this master on switch that Mike was uh, talking about. And Plexicon, uh, in collaboration with Roche and Genentech, worked very hard on the development of compounds that might latch onto that altered protein um, and uh, shut it down. So th here's that protein right there. It's called RAF. It, there's the mutation that occurs. Uh, and here's the, the drug that was developed that shuts down that protein. And the question is, so what? Might that help people with melanoma? And this is all, you know, over the, the drug was just actually approved, so I'm telling you the answer here, uh, about a couple of months ago. Um, but I want to show you, because if, if this projects, um, uh, a, a, a kind of a dramatic demonstration of how this can work when it works. And it works about 50 or 60 percent of time in melanoma patients with this mutation. So this is a patient who first presents. And you can see, I hope, um, you know, all these different uh, nodules uh, from the metastatic dissemination of this melanoma throughout the body. Uh, it's a very serious condition at this point. This is after 15 weeks on the drug. Uh, so we looked at this and we said, you know, unbelievable, this is like almost miraculous. Here's the problem. Um, as good of a drug as it is, look what happens. Um, almost all the patients um, regenerate their disease, and, and maybe we can talk about this during the discussion just a bit, you can almost on a one-for-one -one basis, you know, match the nodule in the panel A with panel C. So it's kind of roaring back as if the cancer can overcome the very dramatic effect of the drug, but figures out ways to uh, become resistant. So, you know, I want to leave you with a sense that we're making good progress. Uh, it's not enough, but clearly we have the foundations uh, of uh, uh, from, the, from, the, from the science, you'll hear more about this from David, I'm sure, uh, to give me a lot of uh, optimism, if not in three to five years, certainly over the next 10 to 20 years, that we'll be able to turn cancer into a, really a, a chronic disease. And my last slide here is just a, a one sentence from a, a recent um, uh, kind of a editorial mini-review from uh, um, three important investigators in the field. And the, the sentence I extracted here was that at this time of unparalleled promise in cancer biology, the biggest risk to progress may be economic. Uh, th their thrust here is that in this you know, time of really declining resources for R&D, uh, rising healthcare costs, 
increased cost of dr drug development here that there's certainly a serious risk that we might not be able to maximize you know, all the, the, the value that we're extracting from the science, uh, and I hope we, this won't be an obstacle, but it's certainly something else to think about. Thank you. David? All right, thanks. I, I hope the audience appreciates that you're hearing the stuff of legend. I mean, these, these are huge, huge scientific breakthroughs that we're hearing about. So in, in, engineers like me are, are coming along late in, in trying to make uh, a revolution based on the ideas that were, that were generated out of that amazing time uh, by Mike and Harold when it was first discovered uh, that cancers are really caused by mutations in the DNA. And here's a, here's a nice depiction of DNA as the double helix, the A's, C's, T's, and G's with colored bars. Uh, it's important to think about this fact that you start with a single cell that contains a DNA message that you got from your mom and your dad, and it, that cell creates all of the trillions of cells in your body. And it's really a numbers game, as we've heard about. Some of those cells will undergo mutations, and when one goes rogue, in the fashion that was so eloquently described by the previous two speakers, uh, then we get a disease that we know as cancer. The genome itself was a hidden mystery. Uh, you know, Mike could tell us kind of the, 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 the ways that he approached it. You, you don't think about it anymore, but, but the, the genome was totally terra incognita at the time uh, that Mike was doing his work and, and through Art's earlier work. And so it's it's exciting revolution that happened uh, in the year 2000 when we got our first glimpse of the genome. We, through the international consortium, 20 sequencing centers all around the world, cranked through the genome sequence and produced our first glimpse at this uh, beautiful uh, piece of work of nature that is at the at the heart of every one of our bodies. This was celebrated. You see this little picture here of of. Uh, uh, Craig Venter and Francis Collins with President Clinton. I won't go into the whole details. There's no time to tell the, tell the side story, but there was a competition between a private uh, corporation headed by Craig Venter and the public effort, and it was declared a tie at this meeting in June, on June 26th when we both announced uh, that we had sequenced the uh, first draft of the human genome. Behind the scenes, and this is for Santa Cruz uh, people, there was a, a, a student at Santa Cruz, his name is Jim Kent, who was furiously working on his computer, and he was one of the first engineers to make an enormous impact on genetic, genetics by putting together the pieces. There were roughly 600,000 pieces of DNA that had come off the sequencing machines, and he assembled them into this first coherent version of the human genome, and it finished four days before this June 26th uh, meeting that was prearranged. Because of that, because of Jim's extraordinary effort, uh, we are deeply honored at Santa Cruz uh, to have been able to be the first to post the working draft of the human genome, our first glimpse of 3.7 uh, billion years of evolution, and it was uh, on July 7th. Now, this chart is one of my favorite charts, and I'll say just one thing about it. That green represents the total outgoing internet traffic from the entire campus, and you can see <laughs> <laughs> and you can see that what happened on July 7th was a singular event. Uh, three, tr half a trillion bytes of data was, uh, was, was transferred onto the internet in, in that 24-hour period. So humanity was interested in, in seeing its, uh, its genetic heritage for the first time. And since then, it's become a very important basis for research. In fact, uh, Jim's team and others at, at Santa Cruz uh, have created a, a web-based interface to really make the genome part of the integrated web-based information exchange. So this brings the original draft sequence up into the digital age in a very strong way. Uh, there are hundreds of thousands of scientists, uh, both basic researchers and, and applied medical researchers, who access the genome. We get 17 million hits on this web page per month. So we are now a very important purveyor of information about this one reference draft sequence, which is now considered finished at this point. And so it gives us a glimpse of a, a one typical human being. Now, 
That's a genome that's completely intact and is the kind of genome you want in the cells in your body. Uh, but the genomes you've been hearing about are quite dramatically different from that. And so now we're in the process of sequencing cancer genomes, and we're sequencing them at a very, very high rate. And here's a picture of the enemy, if you will. This shows how complicated cancer genomes are. The reference genome goes around like clockwork, chromosome 1, chromosome 2, chromosome 3. And every time you see one of these red lines, this means uh, a piece. For example, this red line means a piece of chromosome 1 in this tumor is actually attached to a piece of chromosome 6. So the, the, the chromosomes have actually been cut and pasted back together. This line outside, the red line that you see here along the, uh, along the circle, represents the number of copies that we have for each of the genetic regions. Now, if it was a good genome, you would have two copies, one from mom, one from dad. So wherever this thing is not two, we have an abnormal copy number. You're looking at just one of the many, many genomes that we are now sequencing as part of the Tumor Genome Atlas Project, that we'll, which we'll talk about in a minute. And in fact, this one happens to be a brain cancer genome, uh, glioblastoma, which is a particularly deadly disease. So what is the future? What can we learn from sequencing first hundreds, then thousands of genomes like this? Well, the hope, as we've heard before, is to use the information from these genomes to treat cancer better. And as Mike said, it is an individualized problem. There are no two tumors that are exactly identical at the genetic level. So we have to think about this in terms of looking at the molecular information from each tumor and making a decision. And that will not be done one at a time. It's going to require a very large database of cases. So in this picture, we're illustrating the idea of personalized cancer treatment of the future, in which the, 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 the uh, individual patient has a particular uh, genome sequence that is now obtained cheaply. The cost of genome sequencing is dropping at an astounding rate, and we're talking about a few thousand dollars now to obtain this information. And that information is compared to a vast number of other genomes that have been previously sequenced where we know the outcome. We know what treatments were applied, and we know what works and what doesn't work. And based on those comparisons, the vast comparisons in this large database, we hope eventually that doctors will be able to make better decisions. Now, how big is this database? This is a little bit of illustration of that. We are now building a database that will be five petabytes of data. And it's very hard, to, we struggled on how to visualize what does five petabytes of data really mean. Well, if you take all of the written works of humanity from the very beginning, recorded, of recorded history in all languages, you get roughly 50 petabytes. We're one-tenth of that already, our database of cancer genomes. So it is an enormous amount of data, and that's just the beginning. The project that I'm talking about, which was mentioned by Mike as well, is the Cancer Genome Project. This is the flagship project, the lead project out of the National Cancer Institute that's looking at 10,000 patients. It's much larger than all of the other cancer genome sequencing in the entire world put together. And it's organized nationally, and you see here that there are data centers, and now there's uh, sequencing centers and analysis centers, and there's one data center, and we're very, very proud to be building that right here at Santa Cruz. So that will hold the, the data from this uh, enterprise, also from the target uh, uh, project, which is a project looking at the five major childhood cancers. And we hope that that will grow beyond these initial flagship projects out of the NCI. So in closing, I think we have an extraordinary opportunity. Cancer is caused by mutations in the genome. We now have the technology to read all of the mutations in the genome for the very first time. And with the community's help, we can bring this information to bear on the battle against cancer. It's time that the digital age meets cancer. And we can do this. We can do this head on at this point with the technology that we have. Well, now I'll actually have a conversation, and I'll look for some questions from the audience. But I really want to get back to this baseline. Uh, uh, we only have to go, you know, 30 years ago or so, and someone had cancer. 
uh, there was this feeling it's your fault or there is uh, uh, there was a lot of secrecy. People didn't talk about having cancer. Uh, and we've come a long way, uh, but I think the latest change that, pe that people have is, is that this idea that given the role of genetic mutations in creating cancer, how true can we say it is that every cancer is different? Every cancer evolved on its own within the individual. Well, David just told you. David, you want to say it again? Well, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> we, we look at the genomes and no two are alike. There's no question about that. But there is an important point. There are no two that are identical, but there is overlap. Yes, there, there are, are patterns common, that recur. Common jammed accelerators and some common defective breaks that occur in different kinds of cancers, and that should be where we'll focus first to try to, to hit those because you'll get the biggest bang for your buck out of that. And we know of at least 25 or so such that are sufficiently common. But there are hundreds, and well, uh, I guess the, just the sample on how many mutations are in a cancer genome, it can be as high as 100,000, 100,000. Uh, but in that, there are maybe 25 or 30 that really count, and many of those are shared from one tumor to another. So that's the ray of hope here in the face of this extraordinary diversity. That's right. It isn't just random out there. It's, it's a question of what particular sequences are malfunctioning. Now, you and I could have the same malfunctioning sequence, but you dropped one letter and I dropped another letter. It rendered it inoperable. And so that's the specific thing. So we've got some commonality, but we also have some differences. Now, one man's genetic mutation is maybe another man's genetic inheritance. Is it possible to be just simply cancer prone just from your genetic inheritance? Well, I think we could all answer that. Uh, yes, and there are two kinds, of, two kinds of pre-susceptibility. Uh, One is what we call strong single genes. So you, many of you, perhaps all of you heard of the BRCA gene. Uh, this is a break. And if it's defective and inherited, it creates a, a, an, a, an absolutely uh, awesome predisposition to breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and incidentally, prostate cancer. Um, so that's a strong inheritance. Every generation, if there are at least a few siblings uh, with f women, they're going to they're have breast, one, one or more of them is going to have breast cancer. It's, it's a powerful predisposition. And we have a genetic test for analyzing families to see whether that uh, is responsible for a family a history of breast cancer. But then we have another more problematic set of genes, which David could comment on too, I think. These are called weak predispositions. And, uh, um, every issue of the journal called Nature Genetics has got 10 papers with each has 40 authors and another five weak predisposition genes for diabetes or cancer or hypertension or whatever. Th this, whether we'll ever be able to use these is a moot point at the moment, I think. Uh, there's a company called Decode in Iceland, which uh, several years ago c came up with uh, a rather limited, I think about seven, uh, Seven genetic changes that they argued, if they occurred together uh, in a woman's, uh, among women's genes, that they had maybe a, a 20% risk of developing breast cancer. Now, that's a modest increase, but it's, it's a level of increase that f clinicians believe would justify an MRI examination. The problem is this only present in about 5% uh, of women, but the bigger problem is the statistics are not good. The sample sizes have not been large enough. The, the test has gone nowhere. It's highly controversial, if not dead. David, is, which is it, controversial or dead? I, you know, I wouldn't want to judge this one, but I, I agree with you that we are seeing a much stronger effects in terms of the somatic changes, the, the, the changes that weren't inherited, but the changes that happened during the course of a patient's lifetime. That's going to contribute the larger amount, apart from these already known strong cases where there's a strong effect. The only thing I'll say in defense of these so-called genome-wide association studies is that they often point to pathways or interrelated sets of genes that, that weren't known to be relevant at all in cancer. And if they're statistically sound, now we know that they are relevant in cancer, uh, even though one of them or two of them that are actually investigated by themselves don't have a big effect. Oh, I, I agree. And I, I didn't mean to totally, I, I just meant to represent the state of art. I think it's entirely conceivable that we'll come to a point where uh, you know, given our com the power of our computation, uh, we'll be able to say, oh, yes, if, uh, if a woman has 
these 400 <laughs> week changes, uh, she'd better have a mammogram every year. Uh, absolutely, that, that day may come. It's just not here yet. Not well, here yet. Thank you for indulging me because I wanted to get that all back in one line here because now we get on to some new things. We're doing whole genomes. Whole genome, people, we've got a lot of companies now in the race to produce whole genomes so fast and so cheaply in economic terms, they're saying, we'll actually give you the genome if we can sell you some services and, and diagnosing and analyzing them afterward. So early diagnosis is extremely important in cancer. And I think a lot of people want to know, what are the opportunities now that we're going to be able to get more data on people? Are we going, how are we going to be able to do early diagnosis in cancer before we have a tumor? If you look at the impact of early diagnosis and better therapies from the last, uh, from 1988 to 2000, which is the last segment that I've been able to come up with, uh, it shows that uh, cancer uh, patients added four years to their life. Uh, and part of that, again, is early diagnosis, because if you can catch a, dis a tumor before it disseminates or metastasizes, and you, can, you have a good chance of surgically removing it, and the outcome or the prospects are generally very, very good. Um, and of course, uh, on top of that, there are much better therapies these days, not perfect, but better therapies. But uh, uh, maybe something that we could touch on uh, that's received a lot of uh, notoriety, publicity, just even in the last couple of weeks is the PSA, the, pr the test for prostate ca cancer. Um, this came, th this test, uh, it, this is a marker of, of prostate cells. And when you have prostate cancer, you have more prostate cells than, a, than if you don't have uh, uh, a prostate cancer. And these prostate cells make a particular, secrete a certain antigen protein called PSA that you can measure uh, in your blood. And uh, the, the test was put into wide use sometime in the mid-1990s. And as a result of that, uh, the, the, the incidence of prostate cancer increased by so much that it actually affected the overall incidence of all cancers of all type in men and women in the United States. I mean, you look at the, you know, the incidence of cancer, which is actually the last 15 years coming down slightly. There was, there was a nice spike in 95 or 1996, clearly just due to what was thought to be earlier diagnosis. Now, the dilemma is the, that uh, if you look to see how useful that test is, even though it's, you know, it can be specific for prostate cancer, you know, the, the, the best clinical uh, uh, data says that for every... 1,400 men that get tested and screened with PSA, you save one life. Okay, so it, it's not like you, you're helping 20 or 30 or 80 percent of people. It's one out of 1,400, and at that level, you know, you one has to even question the math at a very fundamental level. But the, the, on the further downside to that is it, it, it also generates 48 unnecessary, pretty intensive operations. It could be a surgical removal of the prostate. It can be you know, weeks of radiation for no benefit, but a lot of cost and anguish and, and, and no benefit. So we have to be, I think, very careful. And that, you know, I think illustrates it. The, the early diagnosis is good. There's suggestions now and there's indications that by using very sophisticated DNA measurements that we can actually find a circulating tumor cell of a lung cancer or a colon cell in the blood. And if you find a cell or two, okay, you probably have cancer, but where is the cancer? How do you treat it? Um, it, it we're still a ways away, I think, from being able to, in a general sense, exploit this earlier uh, diagnosis by some of the more recent molecular techniques. You're just holding, you're holding the mic for him. Oh, yes. good. Yes, right. <laughs> he always has something more interesting to say. <laughs> I just want to be able to pass the baton to the next generation repeatedly during this program. <laughs> uh, I agree with what Art said, um, and uh, I can drive, but I, I think there really is some hope. I mean, the genome may come to the rescue here because um, let me give you an example. Um, an example is Hubert Humphrey. Um, Hubert Humphrey died of bladder cancer. And when he first was first seen for his bladder complaints, it was decided that he had some mild local disease. And he was treated locally. And then about three years later, they decided, well, yes, you actually do have uh, uh, a tumor, but it's benign. It's not bad. And about three years later, they decided this is bad and did radical surgery. And three years later, he died. Okay, if you're doing your arithmetic, there's over a decade has elapsed there. Now, some years ago, this was all happening at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, some years ago, uh, a young scientist at Johns Hopkins went back and got all the specimens from Humphrey, including the cells from his urine. And he looked in there for one of the premier bad breaks in cancer. 
and it was in the very first specimens. And if they had known that, they would have known from the get-go to aggressively uh, treat Mr. Humphrey, and he might have survived to run for office again. So that's the sort of thing we hope will be possible. You know, every uh, uh, organ system in our body that has access to the external world, world releases cells. Uh, our bladder, our kidneys, uh, our lungs, our, our intestinal tract, uh, breast uh, uh, fluid. So there's some hope that this so-called molecular cytology could be turned into a truly um, uh, uh, decisive detection. But I want to add a caveat. There's emerging evidence that the, uh, let's take breast cancer as an example. There's emerging evidence that the most aggressive tumors that inevitably kill uh, metastasize at a very early stage. And that even the earliest conceivable detection may be uh, too late. Now, uh, I, I, I say that as a caveat, not as a, an established fact, but uh, it, it's something we have to bear in mind. Now, David, there's a lot of questions in here about uh, databases as well as uh, sort of tissue banks and that type of thing. One of the things I want you to be really clear about is the 10,000 cancer genomes you're getting. Are you getting tissue? Are you getting data? And what kind of data? What are we talking about here? That's really important to know. It's purely digital. So we're talking about a digital library of cancer genomes, no tissue. The tissue is kept separately for the TCJ project and other major cancer projects. And that uh, actually frees us uh, to, to be a little more creative. On the other hand, uh, of course, these are personal genomes from patients, and, and so we are uh, enforcing the highest level of security on these data so that only qualified researchers have access to that. In this sense, we are an extended arm of the National Institute of Health. In fact, we are the first uh, to establish a relationship called Trusted Partner, which is more or less invented so that we could have agencies like us could redistribute data in a meaningful way to researchers. Uh, and that uh, gives us the big responsibility, uh, but it also allows us to replicate these digital data in, a, in, 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 in a way that makes it broadly, all of them broadly accessible to the best minds. And, and that's really the important thing. We have, I, when I talk, I, I go out and I give speeches at, at universities. I, you know, I gave a, a speech at Berkeley, uh, for example, just recently. And uh, I found colleagues in areas of computer science and other areas of engineering just extremely excited by this. Uh, one, of, one of the most famous computer scientists in the world is Dave Patterson at, at, at Berkeley, and he's totally engaged in analyzing cancer genomes at this point, and it's a, it's a change in his career, in a sense. And that kind of mind, that beautiful, deep knowledge of how to deal with data, large amounts of data in the digital age, is that's the minds we want to be looking at these data and working closely with the National Institute of Health and, and the researchers who've spent their careers looking at data, uh, like uh, looking, thinking about cancer. That, those are the, exactly the kind of people we want to get looking at these data. Okay, so conceptually what we're talking about is they're not sending you any tissue. We're taking tissue from for instance, cancer tumors or, or cancerous material, if you will, whole genome. That's right. All the DNA, sending it, and you're, you're storing the whole genome for digitally. Um, there frequently should be a baseline. Are we taking, do we have uh, the non cancerous tissue? Okay, From so we have the non cancerous DNA, whole genome, the cancerous DNA genome. Yes. Now, we haven't talked about epigenetics. There's more than just the DNA. That's Who true. Wants to take that. Well, I'll just just quickly say that from each patient, we get a blood sample, which tells us what the what the normal genome is for that patient, and then we get a tumor sample, which tells us what what has changed in the tumor, what are the mutations relative to the patient's normal genome uh, in the tumor, and then we also get information about the what's a thing called DNA methylation, which is an epigenetic mark. It's a mark that it occurs on DNA that the cell puts there. And it has to do with whether uh, the cell is going to use that piece of DNA or not. So some genes are turned off 
by methylation marks, and some genes are, are turned on. And we can have that information about each cancer uh, patient as well. So uh, just conceptually, what's happening here is that we're taking a whole lot of things that used to be in tissue or, or just in a, a little bit, we're looking at this, because of the technology, we can only look at so much of the, this gene or so much of this sequence. We're talking whole genomes, we're talking reference genomes, we're talking additional data. And I think what's so amazing is that when you put it in a huge information base that can be accessed by people who have all kinds of capabilities, you change it. The very same person you're talking about, Dave Patterson, we, f we forget that he and John Hennessy, who is president of Stanford, wrote, uh, back when they were both just computer science types and friends, wrote, you know, uh, structural, you know, structural architecture of computer systems textbooks and things like that. That yes. gave me a couple there. John never thought he would be president of Stanford, and Dave Patterson thought he would never be working in bioinformatics. And right. so this is the kind of thing that can happen. People who are doing things never related to that opens up the entire process to working on things that hadn't happened before. So when we're talking about where are we going in the future, it's part of we have more people being able to work on it, not just more, uh, more people doing the same things as ever. The, the nature has changed. Now let's talk about, uh, we have a lot of questions here, and I'm just gonna put, throw out a few of the different cancers, and so perhaps someone could pick one. We got esoph esophageal cancer, we've got ovarian cancer, uh, we certainly have the prostate cancer question, uh, we have many of those. Does, uh, on, on any of the things you're talking about, are, are there, can anyone wanna pick out a particular cancer to talk about, to respond to that? Go ahead, Art. Uh, so, Touching on that and also just looking at the future of uh, potential uh, treatments, I'll, I'll, I'll use ovarian cancer as an example. So a lot of ovarian cancer genomes have been sequenced and one of the surprising and I think daunting um, conclusions is that about one in seven of women with ovarian cancer actually have a jammed accelerator. Uh, the, the, and as Mike pointed out correctly, that it's in, in the world of uh, possibilities, it's relatively easy to stop that jammed on accelerator. We don't know how to stop the, the suppressors. And in the case of ovarian cancer, relatively few are driven by that active oncogene. Um, they have these suppressor mutations, uh, deletions, they have these epigenetic changes, and we don't really know how to deal with that. Uh, but looking ahead, uh, the, the reason, so the, the, that's, a, that's a pessimistic uh, outlook. The, the reason for optimism, I draw back on the experience with, with, uh, with, with HIV, um, AIDS, the AIDS virus. Uh, it, like the, the virus, uh, viruses that Mike was talking about, the RNA tumor viruses, um, the, the AIDS virus is relatively simple. It only encodes a few genes. And the initial attempts at therapy involved blocking the activity of one of those gene products that was required for the virus to replicate. And as I think everybody in the audience knows, th th those therapies, molecules worked, but not very well. They would drop your viral load for three months, six months, or a year, but th the virus always would come roaring back because of mutations. Th the virus would figure out how to get around that particular inhibitor. Uh, we're now at the point where we have drugs against m men essentially all the essential components of the uh, HIV virus. And when you hit a patient who has HIV with, let's say, a triple combination, what's called a triple combination regimen cocktail, where you're interfering right at the beginning with three essential functions, the, the outcome is really quite dramatic. It's, it's not a cure, but people you know, typically will live often the duration of their normal life because the virus is so s stopped uh, in, in its replicative ability that, you know, for all practical purposes, in many, many cases, uh, it, it's almost, it, it's effectively a cure. Um, so uh, the same thing is going to happen, I believe, with cancer. So we, we now know if some cancers, uh, AML, uh, 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 ALL uh, type of leukemia, typically has very few um, genes that are activated, but it's not one. It's, it might be four or eight. Other cancers, like lung cancer from a smoker, might have uh, 20 or 30 or even 60 driver mutations. But the way we're going to solve cancer, in my opinion, is to simultaneously intercept three, four, or five of these essential proteins at once, because that's going to be able to shut down not just one pathway, but potentially two or three simultaneously. But as importantly, in the long run, it's going to probably allow us to stop the resistance, because there, it's very easy when you have literally billions and billions of cancer cells. We can go through some math, but it's, it's, it's relatively straightforward. When you have that many cancer cells, there are pre-existing cancer cells that essentially allow any given cancer that might 
be otherwise susceptible to a given treatment to get around that treatment because there's so many cancer cells with inherent mutations. So if you blast it at multiple points, not only are you interrupting many of the pathways at once, but you can then simultaneously suppress the, even the activity of that rare, potentially resistant cell. So I think over the next 10, 15 years, that's the way we're gonna really cure cancer, but it will take some time. Yeah, combination therapies, familiar to you folks, I'm sure. Uh, and this is just the latter day form of it, uh, a form that's far more sophisticated, rational. Uh, and let me give you an interesting example. There's a disease called acute promyelocytic leukemia. This disease was incurable until about 25 years ago when some scientists in Shanghai uh, discovered, we won't even go into the names, treatment X, that ha suddenly was able, was a was a treatment that would put these patients into remission, uh, but then they would relapse. So they combined the treatment X with some existing poisons, as they've been called rightfully, and they got eventually about 80% cures, but the 20% remained resistant. Then they came upon another treatment, Y, which actually was derived from a Chinese folk medicine. It's a great story, but there's no time to tell it. And they combined X and Y, and they're now curing everybody. And you know what? X and Y attack the same molecule, the same accelerator. They just attack it in different ways. So if you have two very small risks of uh, resistance arising in that molecule, and you, and you hit the molecule in two very different ways, the risk of resistance becomes infinitesimally small, and that's why the combination cures. It's, it's combination therapy attacking a single molecule. Now, Art's talking about what will usually be the case. We'll attack several molecules, uh, but remarkably, uh, uh, this works by attacking one, and the drug Gleevec, which is probably known to most of you, the, the so-called miracle drug, um, um, that is very effective against early stage chronic myeloid leukemia, but rather uh, limited effect against the final acute phase of it. Uh, patients develop resistance to it. But there are now drugs that overcome that resistance because they hit the molecule in a different way. And experts like Charles Sawyers, and I'll join him in this, are betting that when you combine the Gleevec and the derivative that overcomes the resistance to Gleevec by attacking the molecule in a different way. You put those two together and you may cure the disease just the way APL is cured by attacking the same molecule. So the point is that we've got problems, but we also have some pretty smart people working on them. You know, it's, it's so interesting that you're talking about it just this way because we uh, have a number of cards here which, who re which really react. People obviously reacted to your melanoma uh, slide here. Um, and they're asking things like, well, is the, is the protein mutating? Is the DNA, what's, what's mutating here? And if you're talking about multiple attacks, you can be, it can be changing. But it's like, but we got you that way. Turn your head again, we got you that way, we got you this way. Is this sort of the, the sense that whatever it's doing, you're getting it, it's not, a, it's not a static, it's actually dynamic and trying to fight back? Uh, it's Darwinian. There you go. Yeah, it's Darwinian. <laughs> um, <coughs> cancer cells, um, we call it, a, they have an unstable genome. They are exceptionally prone to genetic damage. Uh, and they are that way because one of the early steps in the genesis of a cancer cripples uh, the cell's ability to keep its genome intact, to repair the DNA when it's damaged, uh, to, to keep uh, the cell uh, dividing correctly, segregating chromosomes uh, when the two cells divide correctly. That mechanism is crippled early in cancer, and that, that allows mutations to occur more frequently. And the problem just amplifies as, uh, as the tumor cell uh, uh, moves along its lifespan. Uh, as a result, if you, um, as Art explained, um, in that mass, large, vast number of tumor cells, there's probably at any given time a change that will make it resistant to the existing drug. Uh, it's not a deliberate act, it's, it's a random act. It's a random change in the genome. But the drug selects for it. So this cell thrives while the others are dying and suddenly you've got a resistant tumor. 
And the point we're making is if you can hit the cell in two or three different ways at the same time, you reduce the likelihood that one cell is going to have resistance to all three or four attacks. That's what we're talking about. Great. Distinct, yeah, distinct different uh, approach. So, Art and then Dave. So you end up with a, with a model for, for personalized cancer therapy in which it's a strategy game. It really is a strategy game to not only knock the cancer down immediately, but to prevent the, the recurrence, the emergence of resistance. And that uh, will increasingly have complex consequences for, for the analysis of these data. Also, in, in light of what uh, Mike was saying, you see that once the cancer itself is prone to mutation, that you're going to get an enormous number of decoy mutations or passenger mutations, that, as they're called. And these are mutations that aren't really driving the cancer, but can confuse a computational algorithm that's looking at all of the mutations in the genome and not uh, and prevent it from maybe seeing the true driver. So there, there is an enormous amount of, of very deep algorithmic strategy, very deep computational strategy that's going to have to be applied to these data before we can get real cancer treatments out of it. Maybe I'll just add a little bit more color to the, the patient, the melanoma patient that uh, uh, I showed. Um, Mike wonderfully and correctly points out the examples, two, the two examples uh, of, of others that uh, uh, if you can hit a given active accelerator in two different ways, you might very well have a much better outcome. I completely agree with that. What we're learning from some very recently published work uh, in, in melanoma with this BRAF mutation is that the resistance almost never in that particular case comes from a second mutation or a pre-existing mutation in BRAF. It's always coming, from, uh, we can name the genes, it doesn't matter, but th th they're popping up from somewhere else. And one of the, I think I'll, I'll, maybe I'll just come back to the, the point about the lesions, the metastatic lesions, almost like reappearing in every single case. It, it, maybe it's always dangerous to do a little bit of math, but, th but this is simple math and it's really sobering. Um, if you have a, 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 a diagnosis of a cancer, uh, and, and let's say the mass is one cubic centimeter, uh, is about two and a half centimeters per inch, so it's, it's not very much. It's like a little ball like that. Um, there are about a billion cells uh, in that ball. Now, if you ask, um, how many divisions does it take to get to a billion cells? It's, it's about 30. So in other words, you have one cell divides into two. That's a division. Then it goes to four and eight, da, da, da. So, you know, two to the 30th is about a billion. So, 30 divisions. Now you can ask, what is the mutation rate um, at each division? And we know from the, the enzymes that copy DNA, uh, there's a mistake made about one every 100 million times. David can probably refine this a little bit. It's probably even higher in a lot of cancers, but I'm being yeah. conservative. Uh, there's three billion nucleotides in every genome. So, that means that every division, there are about 30 mistakes in the best of cases. So you go play it out 30 divisions, and now you're talking a couple of thousand mutations, but you have a billion cells. And the way the math, if you just, you know, the numerator, the denominator works, it's, it's frightening because it says that in a, ma a mass of a billion cells, you can expect that essentially every single nucleotide in at least one of those cells will be mutated. And some of those mutations are going to give you resistance to whatever drug you have, be it in the primary, you know, protein that you're attacking, or who knows what else that will allow that cell to come back. So what's probably happening, my guess, in, the, in these lesions all, you know, flourishing after some period of time is that in those, you know, billion cells per lesion, there are pre-existing cells that are inherently resistant to the therapy. It, after 15 weeks, it looks like, oh, fantastic. You know, we all can celebrate and jump up and down because 99.9999% of the cells are dead, but there's that one or three cells in almost every spot that doesn't care about your drug. And it grows and grows, and after three months, six months, a year, year and a half, you see that elaboration of the, of the cancer that almost recapitulates the first, you know, uh, presentation. So this is tough stuff. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> wow, Art did it. <laughs> I'm going to ask you one quick question here. I was going to ask you to wrap up, but uh, this is a very poignant question. Um, and before we go to the wrap up, and it says, uh, I'm a cancer survivor. Knowing what you know today, doesn't matter what kind of cancer, uh, how do you want me to think? about my cancer? 
I don't know how to answer that question without knowing a lot more. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, 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 I think it's an attitudinal question. Beg pardon? It may be an attitudinal question uh, about attitude. Uh, if, 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 if you're wondering about the risk of recurrence, it depends entirely upon the nature of the original tumor and how long you've survived already. Uh, and uh, if you're wondering about the prospects for future therapies, should you have a relapse, uh, it would again depend on the type of tumor. We, we have, uh, as you've heard, we have new magic bullets for some, but not for others. Um, uh, so th there are many determinants. There's no simple answer to that question. Any other contributions there? I, I, you know, uh, of course, I, I, I don't want to give any personal cancer advice, but I would say as a community, we need to lobby for larger sharing of, of these data. We need, the government doesn't have enough money really to explore enough of the mutations that are being manifest in all of the tumor tissues that are flowing through our hospitals every day. Uh, and a lot of, a lot of potential data that we could get from these, these tumors is, is not available simply for lack of funding. Now that we can sequence the DNA, we have the possibility of collecting an enormous amount of data. So I, I would just say advocate, and, and if you have, uh, if, th if through your advocates you can advocate for, for a more uh, deeper molecular characterization and for those data to be stored in the database so that the next patient, maybe it's your son or daughter, uh, can benefit from the knowledge of the molecular changes that were in your tumor, that's something that you can do. Everyone can do this. If, but we need, we really need a, a, a public effort behind this. Well, we haven't gotten to some fabulous questions here. Uh, the antithesis of that is saying, saying if, uh, if, I, if, I, if I give my cancer cells and they, they result in a, a, a successful treatment, do I, do I get some money back? <laughs> and, uh, I would say, yeah, uh, give unselfishly. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there are some really great questions in here and some of the new technologies and specific questions on cancers. And I'm sorry we can't get to each and every one of them because they're all very valid. Uh, so let me ask you uh, each to give uh, one last uh, sort of a wrap up, uh, whatever your last word. I'm going to start with you, David, and, and come back here to Mike. David. Well, I, I'm, I'm deeply honored to to uh, share the stage with these two distinguished gentlemen, and uh, it's been a real experience for me being here. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm happy to, to be in a position maybe to provide some computer science skills, engineering skills to, to this important uh, problem at this stage. Uh, so I look forward to very dramatic changes in our understanding of this disease over the next decade. It's, uh, it's the most exciting time to be in, in cancer research right now. Mark? Well, I'm flanked by uh, two people who, in the end, will, I think, allow us to solve the disease. From, you know, Mike's pioneering work, uh, allowing us to understand the basic nature of the, the genes uh, in, a, in, a, in a both theoretical and a practical sense, uh, that opened the door for all of us, uh, from scientists like David and, and others who are doing these uh, um, genome sequences, I don't know, I we're, we're, we're getting, I think, pretty close to a hundred, uh, um, uh, somebody, a thousand, actually. Um, 10,000 out of the, the Cancer Genome Atlas project. Uh, where are we at right now? How many? We're, we're at uh, about 3,000, I think. Okay, well, it's going so fast, I, I lost track at around 800. Uh, but, but obviously, this is going to then, at a molecular basis, tell us exactly what genes are doing what. So if th with those are the two, you know, pillars of uh, that we need to attack it, and then it's just a matter of being able to figure out how to attack those jammed accelerators. Uh, a, a more daunting task, as we talked about, is to figure out how to maybe restore the suppressor functions, or uh, you know, the way Mike nicely presented, uh, hitting it from the flank. Uh, so I, you know, I think there's every reason to be optimistic, but not necessarily next year or the next year. But my general sense is that we're lagging maybe 10 to 15 years behind where we were with HIV. But look how far we've come there, and I don't see any reason why it will be different with this. Mike. I'd like to um, bring up something that's been neglected in the discussion uh, because we've been focusing on therapy, which is understandable for uh, most of us, cancer is an immediate issue, can it be cured? But in the long run, if we want to truly control this disease, we will control it by prevention. 
Now, I'm a microbiologist originally, and I know the history of infectious diseases. And antibiotics were miracle drugs when they first came in. They're not so miraculous anymore, as most of you probably know. What has reduced the burden of infectious diseases by probably 10,000 fold around the globe over the last three generations? Vaccines, prevention, smallpox, polio, measles, on and on. Uh, I'm not saying we're gonna have a vaccine against cancer. I'm saying we need to understand the cause of cancer, and then when we understand it, we can, in principle, act to prevent it. And we don't know the cause of most of the major killers. That is the most challenging form of cancer research, in my um, opinion. And uh, I'm hoping that genomics will drive that field as well. But so a, as you hear these caveats about prediction of risk, caveats about will these magic bullets of therapy not, uh, be limited in their efficacy, remember that there's another ray of hope. Prevent this disease. Stop smoking. Be careful about sunlight exposure. And as we identify other causes, act on them. We have two vaccines against viruses that cause cancer. One of them, the vaccine against hepatitis B virus, is already reducing the incidence of liver cancer around the world. The other can prevent cervical cancer um, if we give it to our young next generation. Uh, so don't forget prevention. That is, for the long term, I think a, a great ray of hope. Before I turn it over to our host, Mike Bishop, Art Levinson, David Hausler. Thank you. So, so from uh, Hubert Humphrey and uh, in Chinese folk medicine, the combination drugs and uh, UCSC becoming a first trusted data partner, it's, it's been an invigorating and I think inspiring conversation for many of us. So I want to thank uh, all of our panelists uh, one more time, David, Art, Mike, and Moira for a wonderful moderation. Uh, and thank you all for coming to uh, this year's Foundation Forum and see you next year and hopefully in between.